Joining us for our Your Health segment is Dr. Andrea Bafford, Assistant Professor and Chief of Colorectal Surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. Good to have you, we're here to talk about uh, colorectal cancer, which I understand has been uh, declining overall, that's right. but increasing in people under age 50. What, what's going on? Right, that's right. We don't know exactly why it's, it's increasing, and still uh, cancer in pati patients less than 50 account for 10% at most of colorectal cancers, but it has been doubling in rate as opposed to declining, like you said, in everybody else. Probably something to do with um, dietary habits, lifestyle, rising rates of obesity. These are some reasons we think it may be rising, but it's something that definitely is being seen and has even changed our guidelines as to how to screen people for colorectal cancer. Well, I was going to ask if it's gotten to that point yet. How, how have the recommendations changed? It's starting to shift to 45 for the age of a first screening colonoscopy as opposed to 50, which it was in the past. And that's in the case of somebody without a family history. That's right. That's right. So um, people with family members who have had colorectal cancer are at higher risk. and. Um, those people should have colonoscopies 10 years before their family member had colorectal cancer, even if it's before 50. But this is the general population. Uh, some of the societies, like the American Cancer Society, recommends 45 now. What's the process? We, we'll talk about polyps. Is that, is that how it always gets started? Polyps are the growths that are there before the cancer, so yes, they, cancers do start as polyps, and we think it takes a while for those polyps to become cancer, maybe about eight to 10 years. So the whole point in doing your colonoscopy is to find these lesions and remove them before they have a chance to become cancer. Okay, and, and this is obviously, it's a major cancer. It affects one of, one of the, the top cancer right. killers. Right, third most common cancer in men and women, and the third most common cause of cancer-related death in men and women. And if everybody got a colonoscopy when the recommendations say to do it, as a surgeon, you would be far less busy, right? That's right, yeah. Um, so there's an opportunity, but, but the procedure itself has a bad reputation, you could say. Yes, it's not. The, mostly the prep ahead of time isn't the most pleasant. Um, you have to clean out the bowels to be able to see things okay. There are some other screening tests now available that uh, rely on DNA changes in the stool, for example. There's virtual colonoscopies. So in certain cases, there's other options to the standard colonoscopy, and that may help in some cases. What are the pros and cons there? If, if you're able to get somebody, you can't talk somebody into the colonoscopy, right. but you can get one of these yeah. other screening tests What's good, what's bad about so that? So the other screening tests certainly have less prep involved. And then the procedure can be done without any sedation, for example, without any anesthesia. Um, the con definitely, and why I think a colonoscopy is always going to be gold standard, is a colonoscopy allows you to intervene. So if you find a polyp, you remove it right away, as opposed to having a second study or procedure done in order to do your preventative right. um, test. And then also, if you could see something in biopsy, you diagnose it, cancers earlier. Uh, let's get to the phones. Prince George's County, this is Nadia. Nadia, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, you're on. Uh, yes, uh, I was going to ask Dr. Uh, Befford that recently I did do Cologuard, and it did come back positive. My question was uh, how reliable is Cologuard? And, how do I um, prepare myself uh, for the procedure having diabetes? Interesting. Thank you very much. Best of luck to you. Sure. So, uh, Cologar test is, is quite sensitive. It's less able to be specific. So, you may find a change, but it, it's, it doesn't always mean that there's something there. Um, but it's a good entry so that it, it allows us to um, screen people who would benefit then from the more invasive procedure, the colonoscopy. And as far as how to prepare um, with diabetes, uh, we do keep patients on liquid diets for the most part the day before the procedure. So I think it would that helps to maintain the blood sugar levels not uh, at a more normal level as you're doing your prep. And then if you have your procedure earlier in the day, for example, the next day, then then 
um, there'll be less chance of having a low sugar level uh, in the morning. But definitely ask your doctor about that because it depends on, like for example, if you're on insulin, we tend to half the dose of the insulin. So they'll have very specific recommendations for you. They'll review your medications and let you know what to do. But it's definitely something that we're very familiar with and adjust accordingly. Any advances in the, the prep itself? You mentioned that's an objection yes. for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Has it changed at all? Yeah, there's there's preps available now that are very, very low volume. So you're almost doing a couple shots as opposed to having that jug of solution. So that helps a lot. There's ones you can mix with Gatorade, for example, and that's a lot easier to tolerate as well. So there's definitely improvements. Let's take a phone call from Howard County. This is Steve. Steve, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Hi, um, I've had regular screenings since I was 50. I'm 72 now. My mother uh, had colon cancer back in the 1970s. And this last one that I had, uh, I'll have the next one when I'm 75. And my doctor has said that that will be my last one, that they don't screen after your age 75. So I'd like to find out why and why not and why can't I get one? Steve, thanks for the, the phone call. You mentioned there's a, there's a long period of time between polyp, between when a polyp proceeds to become cancer. Is that it? So th that's a great question. And uh, a lot of our guidelines do recommend stopping screening at the age of 75 because you're benefiting less from a prevention standpoint because, again, it takes maybe a decade for a cancer to develop. However, between the ages of 75 and 85 and even older than 85, um, you really decide based on a specific person. So if you're in great health, you have very little medical problems, you know, very active, I still would screen, continue screening um, patients over the age of 75. Um, because you're in such great health, you'll still benefit from finding a cancer early and treating and expect to do well afterwards with treatment. So the caller can probably talk a gastroenterologist into doing a colonoscopy. Right. Mm -hmm. Can he talk the insurance company or Medicare into paying for it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, different reasons to continue to do colonoscopies, and it may be that you have, you know, a family member or some symptoms like blood in the stool, for example, that if you have those things, we do, especially in that um, over 75 to 85, are a little more selective with colonoscopies, um, but reviewing any symptoms that may um, trigger a lower threshold to do the study. Call from Western Maryland. Uh, this is Lisa. Lisa, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Yes, I think you may have just answered my question, but it was more of a case of how is an insurance company taking advantage or lack thereof at a 45-year-old for colonoscopy and going forward. Thanks very much. Probably not something you deal with directly that much. Yeah, I'm less familiar with um, insurance uh, coverage. And um, right now, some societies recommend the 45 uh, age screening uh, initiation, and others don't. So I, I'm not, as far as insurance companies, I think there definitely is enough data. And having a, the American Cancer Society recommend the age of 45 should allow for insurance companies to cover. Is there anything people can do to prevent? colon cancer or, or lessen their potential their for developing it, particularly if there's family history. Yeah, so we, we've been talking about screening, so definitely getting adequate screen, screening, but other things you could do are um, dietary changes, a, a healthy diet high in fiber, um, lower in animal proteins and red meats. Um, that is shown to increase um, those things are shown to increase colorectal cancer, so if you're able to control those things, it's helpful. Um, regular exercise, so physical inactivity has some association with colon cancer. Maintaining a healthy weight. Um, avoiding excess alcohol intake. Uh, so for men, it's considered two drinks, more than two drinks a day is excess, and for women, one a day. So moderate alcohol intake or none, and then not smoking. So these are all lifestyle things that everyone can do to decrease their risk. What's happening on the treatment side? You, you do surgery, you do it with Definitely. robots sometimes. Yeah, so with surgery, we are able to do the same surgeries 
with less and less invasive means. So um, robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, those are surgeries with minimal incisions. So you're, adequate, uh, you're able to do the adequate cancer surgery, but decrease the time off of work, the amount of pain after surgery, improve recovery. Um, we're trying to preserve organs more, so maybe doing less surgery in a way, period. And then um, from the chemotherapy standpoint, uh, more of the therapies are now targeted. So we're looking at specific cancer genes or the proteins they make or the environment they're in and targeting those specific things so you can individualize treatment. And even with radiation therapy, which we use for rectal cancer, for example, there's improvement. Um, proton therapy is something we offer that decreases. Dr. Baffert, sure. we're going to have to leave it there. Oh, we gosh. appreciate the visit. Thank you so much for joining us. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.